Well, it, it's not working in prod. Indeed, it's not working in prod. Well, it's not my problem. It works just fine on my machine and on the dev server. Well? Well, I told you all systems are ISOs. And if it's working in dev, it's working in prod. It's ISO? Oh, yeah. Essentially, I mean, pretty much almost. Almost? What do you mean, almost? Uh, you know, there's maybe a very small gap in minor versions. And for some plugins. Nothing particularly important. Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's show. Happy Thursday. Um, it's a great Thursday. It, what's that? It's a great Thursday. It's a great Thursday. Of course, you're here. I'm so excited, man. We've been talking about this for a while. I think we got some really cool stuff going on. If you're in the chat, everybody say hello. Love to see who's here. I know I got I got made fun of last week because someone said, "Oh, we're saying where what country we're from." It's very interesting to see where everybody's from and and where you're watching from. So yeah, if you feel comfortable, let us know who you are and where you're from. But yeah, thanks for joining us. So today we have Liram Tao. On, on today's show from Snick or Sneak. Depends on who you talk to over at the company, but- No, no, it's, it's Snick, it's not, uh, it's not open for debate. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, so I'll stick with Sneak. So anyways, Liam is a member of the Node Security Working Group. He's a project lead on the OWASP, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. Okay, we got John here from uh, San Francisco. Hey, John, thanks for sounding off, I appreciate it. And Liram also is the author of two books, Essential Node Security and O'Reilly Serverless Security. And he's also a developer advocate on the Sneak Team. So Liram, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for inviting me. This is, uh, I'm really excited for this, uh, doing more of like this Docker and best practices and involving security into it. So thank you so much. Yeah, of course, of course. But I have to ask, I have to ask the Yoda, the Yoda hat. What, what's, what's going on? Where's the Yoda, the Yoda hat? Story? Is there a story behind that? Yeah. <laughs> There's a story, but we need to get this going in like uh, you know, 10 p.m. for me to drink a bit to tell you that. <laughs> oh, okay. So it's a story that might involve whiskey. Okay. Whiskey Definitely. bourbon, maybe. Okay. All right, cool, cool. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, I love it. I love it. I love baby Yoda. I know, I know I'm on the bandwagon <laughs> a little bit. I'm a I'm a Mandalorian fan. Um, it's cool to be able to bring Star Wars back to my my younger, younger children. So my me and my eight-year-old. Uh, we're die. We wait for Friday nights for the new episode. But awesome, man. Well, thanks for coming on. Are you ready? Are you ready to go? Let's no more chit chat. No, no one came to hear Peter just just ramble on. But love to see what you got going. We're gonna see some really cool stuff here. So if you're ready, let's dive right into it. All right, cool. Let's see what okay. we got. Awesome. So, yeah. Well, let's start with uh, the way that this all got started for me. So I've got some uh, some tabs here waiting for us, but uh, I've made this one ready for us because this is basically how it kind of started. I was like reading a lot of blog posts on Dork, and I was building actually this um, this cheat sheet on you know how you build uh, you know secure Docker file, Docker images, and all of those things. And and I've been reading more and more of this actually recently. And I've seen that a lot of those tutorials just sometimes get things either like out of date or they're just like too naive implementations that might end up doing, you know, really bad in terms of the production quality. Like maybe your Docker containers won't be respon uh, responsive if you wanted to like shut them down or, uh, you know, you might have secrets inside if you're not doing, uh, building them correctly or like they're too big and too vulnerable or, you know, all of those things that, you know, could happen. So I I've just tweeted this out. I said, you know, I'm putting something together. And it turned out into like, you know, this massive, uh, you know, people coming in, you know, retweeting, liking this and saying, you know, looking forward to it and so on. So, uh, so you know, this is basically uh, us basically chatting about all of this work. And I'll give the resource afterwards, like a written down of like best practices. If you want to like just follow through afterwards, uh, very easy. But now we'll try to take some uh, some takeaways from it. And, uh, you know, like, um, where is it? Where is my IDE? Let's see, there we go. Basically start off with, uh, with a blank slate, uh, see, you know, What's up with it, and uh, and uh, go from there. Awesome, awesome. Peter, do you like Node Node applications? Are you like a Node person or a Java person? Basically, I, I'm asking: Are you like a good person or a bad person? Yeah, I'm with you, right? No, of course, I'm a I'm a wonderful, lovely person. And uh, Node, I love Node. I got into JavaScript very heavily in the early 2000s. Right, I was working at a computer manufacturing company, and we had these huge screaming machines on our desktop. And, but we pushed everything to the server, right? And I, I was wondering why, you know, cause we had client server before, then we all went server, pushed everything to the server. 
and we had these big, huge, powerful machines on my on my desktop, and then laptops started to get more powerful. But at the time, uh, Google Maps came out, and Gmail came out, and a lot of client side JavaScript, and they were acting like client, you know, applications. And so I was very curious. So I got heavy, heavy in the JavaScript. I loved the language. I got made fun of by all my peers, and it was just because they they were bad programmers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they just didn't understand, right? Oh, we don't have types. Yeah, of course we don't have types. Anyways, uh, <laughs> anyways, long story short, and then Node came out. I was looking for something where I could run JavaScript across my whole stack so I didn't have to change languages. I was doing a lot of C Sharp and Java back then, and uh, I didn't want to write that. I just wanted to write JavaScript everywhere. So name uh, Node came out. I saw the first video, and man, we went in. Um, I was on the R&D team, and we went into production with Node right away. Uh, so yeah, I wrote my own web server on there, but uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, I that was a long that time. Time. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I that, that time it was like all uh, all the all the uh, all the the blogs and the tutorials were like, uh, how do you do a chat uh, on Node because of like the website as the JavaScript. That was like the only thing that people were uh, doing guides on based on Node back then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I'm I'm a huge Node fan. Uh, Deno, Dino, Deno. That's that's out now. Uh, very, super interesting. Super interesting. I'm not a TypeScript fan though. Not a TypeScript fan. Why put a why put a typed language on top of a non-typed runtime? Anyways, don't don't give me hate on the internet, please. Don't please. <laughs> it's it's definitely a it's definitely a uh, a discussion for beers or food or something. But um, yeah, just my personal opinion. But yeah. <laughs> So let's get started before you lose more friends. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> from the GoLang community as well. <laughs> All right, cool. Let's see. Let's see. So um, basically, let's start off. Like uh, I'm asking you because I've got this uh, this uh, uh, Node app. Obviously, we're building like Node best uh, practices based images. Uh, so I've got this. Uh, I've chosen to use Fastify, which is a great, nice uh, uh, framework for uh, web applications. I've got you know just this one, just this. Uh, there's a recent version been a major tree, I think, going out. So like you should probably check that out as well. Uh, but it's like a really simple application, like nothing uh, too complicated. Uh, you see, just like basically a hello world drop. We're not gonna be involved with it with a node side uh, so much. There will, there's really, there will be a little bit of this, uh, but really it's mostly about how do we build it. So you know, we, people start off with things like from node, right? And then they do maybe your work directory for user source app. Maybe I'll put it there, and, and you know, so so far it's like straightforward thing. Like you'll copy everything from your current environment, like what I have for like the license, the package JSON, the server JS, obviously, and I'll copy them over as well. So you start off like this, you know, maybe you want to do like a run npm install because you need all of those node modules there. And at the end of the day, right, npm start is how I start this up, so I'll probably do the same thing. Right. Can you bump? Can you bump your uh, resolution up just a tiny bit on it? that? Perfect. Oh, Lovely. Thank you. It. Thank you. Yeah, it's good if you want perfect. me. Uh, no, nope. no, there no. we go. <laughs> no, no, you can go back a little bit. That's perfect, right there. Awesome. <laughs> All right, awesome. cool. Thank you, sir. I know it's probably huge on your screen now, but that that's lovely. Uh, no, no worries. It's uh, it will be fun when we get to multi-stage builds, and I'll have to like scroll up and down. That will be fun. <laughs> awesome. But uh, so far, we're good. So I mean, this this looks okay, right? I mean, it, it, it I don't know if it works. We'll see in a second. But uh, it, it looks overall very straightforward, and it's not a bad start if that you know whole tutorial or whatever you're building is like experimentation and trying it out and like starting out new with Docker and you like want to learn how things are done. That's great, right? Right. Um, let, let's see if it works. I'm gonna only to shift some of this stuff. So should be here. I'm sure that we've got the same version. Yep. On the same directory, I am. Is this is this a good font, or do we need? Uh, That's perfect. Here? That's perfect. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yep. Let's try and build this one. So I'll do Docker build. I'll give it this uh, directory as a context, and then I'll tag this as Node.js tutorial, and let's see if that works. Of course, it's pulling a lot of things out of the internet, because uh, Peter, can you live without an internet for a day? No, sir. No, sir, it's essential. <laughs> we had a uh, pretty bad snowstorm here, what, a week or two ago? And yeah, lost power and water. Yeah, you totally lost. I, I need I need the internet. Uh, and I'm ashamed to say that, but I do. Uh, I'm going to join you. I'm not ashamed <laughs> of saying that. <laughs> 
So uh, we'll run this one. I, I think it's on the, uh, maybe uh, it's the, it like this, will be not nicer. So this one is on port 3000. So I'm gonna switch back and make sure I'm exposing these ports specifically um, and run it. So looks like it works. I'm saying uh, these are Fastify's own, uh, um, you know, just log saying it's up and this is the process ID that this is on. So this is, we'll see why this is important later on, uh, but this is basically uh, this console log message, basically just uh, written out with the process it's currently running. Let's see if there's anything there. There you go. Boom. Major success, ready to be deployed in production this moment. I <laughs> ship it. <laughs> it should or shouldn't it? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I think not. I'm going to say no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool, cool. OK, so we've got the basics going. I mean, we're, we're uh, writing well here. Uh, I'm going to stop this for a sec. Of course, it's not going to stop like that. So is another interesting part which will get you. Why is it not stopping correctly? I'm going to scale this down a bit. Yeah, it, this 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 happens a lot, right? You go and stop, you're like, what the heck? Yeah. It's a, it's a funny thing with Docker stop, right? Uh, if if the app is not responding to a specific signal, it's gonna go there and then kill it after uh, 10 seconds. So uh, yeah. this should already give you a hint of why the application did not stop. Uh, and like, why is it bad when it didn't uh, get the interrupt signal? Uh, but we'll get there, we'll get there. I'm gonna tell you all of this ahead of time. Awesome. Cool. So at this point, basically, um, except for this work dear directive, like the, all of this, all everything else is, is kind of bad, like really bad. You do not want to go to production with this kind of Docker file. You need to work a bit to like massage it and get it into like a really good state. Let's start off with like the basic things. For example, from Node. What does from Node mean? I, I have no idea. I need to actually go back into Docker Hub or you know figure out what is the latest version of Node, which probably that's what it means uh, to figure it out. Like I don't know, Peter, do you know what Docker, uh, what what's what Node means here? Yeah, yeah. So it'll go if you just do Node. We have official images on Docker Hub. Okay. And so if we know. if you go into um, if you don't put a fully qualified uh, URI when you're doing it from, it it defaults to Hub and it looks at our Node official image and ends up here and goes, okay, cool. And since you didn't put a tag, the default tag is latest, right? And that's always fun doing latest. So that should have pulled the latest node official image down from Hub. Indeed. So basically what it means is when we're doing this or this, hopefully you're understanding also like when you're building this, that this is really referring to like the latest image being pulled is two things. So first of all, we're taking that latest image, which I have no idea currently what it is. I mean, I could go look for here and see latest is actually mapped into alias into 1511, which is, you know, it's great. I want the latest, but do I want to be on the latest? That's like one question you should ask yourself if you want to be on the latest for production, because, you know, that's maybe experimental, you know, features going out, whatever. I don't know, like maybe you want to pin this down. And there's another reason, right? Which is you probably want to get a uh, reproducible build to so like this, the exact same versions. So if you do from node latest and you continue building this, you know, a week after a week or whatever the the, uh, the release cycle for node is, then it means you're gonna get you know new versions all the time of that image based on the node runtime. So these are two things that you should probably like figure out if that's that's the position you want to be at. Uh, which I'm, I'm gonna like advocate for like no, you do not want to do that because there's like no guarantees of like what's going under. Uh, right. So like unless there's like a specific I don't know use case whatever I, I can't imagine what that would be. Uh, but it's it's kind of like you know we have this package JSON which gives us a range for Fastify. And I don't want to get surprised when I get new minor or, or or patch versions of Fastify. Definitely not the major. So I have this package lock file that tells me I'm gonna pin down the versions every time. So basically, using something uh, sane here, like like an actual uh, reference for an image tag, is is something to start with. So I'm gonna pick up. Um, I'm trying to use something a bit old so we get like uh, some time back, maybe 14, 14, 10, something, 14, 10, 1. Let's, let's go with that one. Yeah, I think I think that's an awesome point, right? Because your your tags are, immu are mutable, 
right? So if I'm using latest and I'm just sitting there building and pushing images underneath you and you're using latest, it'll always point to the latest where the late where the latest tag points to. And that could change underneath you constantly, right? And so the idea is to pin to a specific tag that in theory should stay specifically to that that build, right? Yep. Yeah, it's, it's a huge it's a minor thing, a little thing in your in your Docker file, but it has huge implications, right? For sure. It does. So let's, uh, I mean, this is done. We could try running the app again, but uh, it probably works. So I'll, I'll, I'll kind of like chew along through that one. Um, I don't know if we got any questions so far, but let's uh, let's continue. So far nope, the base. No questions, but we got some folks uh, coming in from uh, the UK. Oh, cool. Good to see you. And he was very happy that we bumped up the, the font size. So, <laughs> I see it now. so value add for me right now, I can leave. That's <laughs> awesome. All right, cool. So the next one is basically um, the NPM install here, right? We want to uh, install dependencies, but again, in like a reproducible way. And what are we actually getting when we're installing NPM install like that? So. The, the very basic things were actually uh, pulling all the dependencies. So uh, this is a small app, and I don't have too much, right? Uh, basically, like nothing beyond, uh, uh, you know, Fastify as a, as a production dependency. But if I had things like, you know, a dev dependencies and so on, I don't want to pull them into the container um, unless there's like a reason for doing that. Maybe you want to run tests within the container or whatever. But mostly, we're talking about like production grade based images for your Node apps, and that's not something I want to pull in there. So you know, one of the ways of doing that is, I don't know, is maybe doing something like um, how do you install that? Let's say you try something like uh, minus prod. It's a good way to to get just production dependencies. Right. Um, what if you have you seen any use cases like this one? I don't know, like npm install and npm update. Have you seen those? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, and I've seen a bunch of uh, npm install, npm update, npm, uh, and then removing cache directories and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. yeah. All right, S scary stuff, basically. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Hope nobody does this on their production apps uh, with the update, uh, especially uh, with like that latest article on uh, from Alex uh, Burchan, if that's how you pronounce their name. But um, like that uh, dependency confusion. If you have so. Slight sidetrack into that one. Uh, that was like a, a, an attack on basically a design of how registries or you know work how they exist, as well as human errors, kind of like and machine errors, kind of like um, uh, not having default configs and not using the right command lines and so on. So if, if that happened, basically uh, that that we put that one again to be more clear. So if you had this npm update as a CLI or in your Docker uh, command anyway, uh, what what that would actually do is it will update all of your uh, package JSON, uh, like package dependencies, even though you have a log file, right? So it's it's a really scary one to to just, you know, run off just like that. You know, be very aware that you have like a proper proxy, private packages are, you know, well scoped and, you know, dot NPM or something like that are like directing to the right places, um, if so to say. But um, anyway, yeah, we don't want to do that. Right. And we can try this. Um, but the problem with that one is something else. The problem is this is only this ensures that we are in, indeed only getting prod dependencies. But if there will be a new version from my prod dependencies that is unaligned with my package log file, at that point my package log file will be modified to to you know whatever that latest version is. So that's not a safe way to do reproducible builds. So really, the only uh, the only way to do reproducible builds that you should have in CI and in your Docker files is uh, is something like the uh, the npm CI. The npm CI basically gives you uh, you know what we need here something something like this to say that this is uh, uh, you know you want production only for uh, for CI. Uh, but any if there's any uh, uh, changes between also like uh, drift between the package JSON and the package log. That will just fail the npm command. So the CI will fail or the Docker build will fail. This is a safe way of doing things. Let's make sure that this gets built. There you go. Hey, Chris. Good to see you there. Yeah, exactly. CI was use, uses the package lock file. All 
right, cool. Okay, so we are advancing here. This is great. What about a way to like optimize um, optimize the so the uh, the tools, the frameworks, what what you have on your node apps, and uh, maybe I've, I've seen like some some tutorials doing uh, node env uh, equals production things like I don't know like run node env export like whatever or just using the env directive it says right. node env is it like this I don't know Did you get it right yep so let's say you're trying there. something like that let's say you're trying you can, something like that. you can do I think you could do it both both ways both ways yeah <laughs> I'm sure that no which is here so this is a nice way of starting things out um but it's it's not always going to be uh for the reason you want it for so uh, I, I would assume that you know most people as a reader blog post maybe they do it because this is kind of like uh, a replacement to that like they're saying well if node in production npm install no so like just install the uh, uh the production dependencies there is a different reason why you would want to like specify node and production unrelated to your app configuration or unrelated to this tag. And uh, let, let me Google that quickly for you and show you what, what I mean by that one. And if I, I haven't pulled that one out yet, uh, but uh, express node of node production, and we'll find it in a sec. So if you're using, for example, express, which is, you know, fairly popular, um, so there's there's a reason that you need to use node and for production because when express like boots up like you know boots, bootstraps as 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 a module inside node it actually looks for this specific configuration environment and when it when it's enabled it will enable things like caching or like uh, um, you know the template views the css views it will actually generate less verbose error messages which we definitely do not want you know verbose error messages in production as well right so right. what i'm kind of like saying here there, there's probably uh, benefits of enabling for uh, this uh, uh, node and production that are beyond just you know the, this this tag for production or maybe you're using this to like load specific production related configuration, but other packages, other frameworks that you're using it may be looking at this that same uh, a node and uh, uh, environment variable, and based on that, they're actually optimizing things, right? Maybe securing things right. and all of those things. So another reason for why you actually want this in. Cool. Awesome. Well, let's uh, let's continue with this one. Let's say, uh, um, I mean, let's see that this is actually uh, building well enough. If I test that one, oh. I shouldn't be any surprises there, but uh, let's, let's make sure. Okay, cool. And and now cool. I think about it. I think I think the uh, the the Docker env command you need a equal sign. I think it'll take both, but I think it's more canonical to put the equal sign changed it there sir go. there we go there we go perfect i make sure Internet, that one internet's gonna uh, yell at me again <laughs> cool cool all right both are building well anyway so, so there are you, we, so yeah. you were saying this is very interesting because i think it was a, i think it's an awesome point um so other packages right will could be using that environment variable you'd say well my my application isn't node the runtime is and other packages could be right so it's a it's a really good practice to sp specifically say hey this is for production right instead of just allowing it well maybe maybe not right it, i i think uh the one of your it's a great point be v as specific as possible right in your docker file right yep. minimal and specific as possible yeah yeah, this is basically also like allowing others to optimize based on you know your intent. Like you're intending this to go to production, and I, I'm not, by the way, like saying that this is like a good practice by other libraries. But you know, at, at the right. very least, like you know, you are like kind of like uh, checking that box and making sure like no one is doing funny things uh, behind the scenes for you know without you. Right. I'm glad. I'm glad you said you shouldn't. Uh, it's an a leaky abstraction, if you ask me, from a, exactly. a package, yeah. right? Using. Yep. I'm not a fan either, but uh, the, you know, Express optimizes based on this, and uh, you know, others as well, maybe. So I'm not going to take the chance of not getting that uh, optimization, especially if there's like uh, security leaks uh, theoretically possible if it's missing. So, right. Yeah. Cool. Um, all right. So, so what's next? So basically, this Docker container, I uh, you know there's uh, uh, there's always this uh, you know uh, uh, 
phrase that we repeat on, which is you know, least privilege, right, in security. And uh, I, I want to say, you know, this defaults into running the process and you know whatever is working here as the root user. And I don't know, like, if anyone is actively asking themselves, like, which user is owning the you know this npm start command and like what can actually go wrong? So let's let's talk about first you know a couple of cases of why this is important. Well, first of all, let's say that um, you are doing something like uh, okay, uh, this is uh, this is big. Oh, so that's hopefully nice. Uh, it's okay. Yes, perfect. Yes. Cool. Uh, so let's say people are. Think something like you know child process and you know exec whatever from command lines. So theoretically, I mean I've I've used Node before as like a, like an offline job server where I wanted to like you know pick up a message a message from a queue and you know do something with it and I'd do it right. So there's no reason why maybe I, at that point I wouldn't be able to like execute uh, you know system processes because maybe I need to do something like that. Maybe I need to. Uh, take an image and convert it from like one format to another or resize it. That's like totally uh, uh, kind of like you know makes sense. So if I do it, I'd probably go and and like you know I I don't think I'll do it in Node maybe. So maybe I'll just spawn off a command and, and do it. So first of all, if something goes wrong here, I mean this is not a safe API. So please do not use the exec uh, API in Node to to spawn commands. But if you've used this and command is somewhere getting from an in from like modified by user input, which by the way, it's not just the command itself. Like maybe you're doing things like, you know, user in convert, and then, you know, I can turn this maybe into a template either all. It would be a lot easier here. Right? And then I could do things like, you know, um, file orig and then file target and all of those things. And Think about it, like even the file name could be something that's generated from like uh, uh, the uploaded file of the user. So this is not a safe API to try. But if you do it at that point, you need to ask yourself, this is someone basically, uh, your application is now vulnerable to command injection. And at that point, this is running as root. So that's not a really good idea to do. Right. Yeah, we have, uh, we have a quick question here. Very we'll cool. probably address it later, but uh, for prod, is it better to use Nginx as a web server and have a proxy for this app? We yes. might be getting to that a little bit later, maybe in multi stage, but yes, I, I would think so too. Liam, what, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, definitely. We always recommend to like front uh, nodes, uh, like for, for like static files and things like that, because like there's no reason for node to like waste IO cycles when you, have, if you can front it with something else. Like that's, that's, that's definitely a best practice. Yeah, yeah. In, in general, because also like, if you are fronting Node as in like a native uh, it, like interaction with nothing uh, uh, beyond that, then is Node now is also like uh, related uh, needs to like do the SSL uh, termination, all of those things, like all of the reasons to basically um, don't let like uh, have this separation of concerns where Node is not doing those things that other components can do. You know, probably better, and you know they are another uh, another guardrail for you. Yes, hundred percent. Awesome. Sorry, threw your, I I threw your no elbow off there. <laughs> question there. Okay, so uh, I mean there are other cases, right? Uh, the other case is I wanted to make that point, and that is, let's say uh, I wanted to like use a library to basically convert my application, right? This is this, we're, we're still here. I'm making the point for why you need like user not fruit, and maybe you're not doing this, but maybe other libraries are doing this. Like maybe you found this uh, PDF image module that gets downloaded, you know, eight thousand times a week. I don't know, doesn't look very active. Whatever, not not something I'd go uh, tomorrow to download. But you know, it has command injection related vulnerabilities probably here because I know what it, what it's doing behind the scene. Uh, is it, uh, it, it is it's counting on the fact that you're doing uh, you, it has image magic available or it's like telling you, you know you should have that available, uh, which is a library or like a collection of like CLIs and, and language bindings and all of those to basically allow you to uh, uh, to convert and like manipulate images. So while you might be using an API like this, you do not know it, but behind the scenes, PDF image is actually executing commands for you. And that's why this, these things are actually important, right? So all, for all the reasons, you do not want to be able uh, to run things as root here. Right. Makes sense so far? Yeah, absolutely, right? Because um, 
if you run it as root, obviously you have access to the whole system. And if you get something injected into a, a weird uploaded file that has commands or whatever, yeah, it's it's no bueno, right? You can get root access to that machine. Not good. And at the very least to the container. Yeah, and like arbitrary command injection on PDF image and remote code execution, whatever, like you do not, like this is the simple input, right? You do not want to be vulnerable to these kind of things. Yeah, that's the scary yeah. one, right? Yep. They're all scary. We're going to go ahead and use uh, user node. Now, how do I know that user node is the, the one relevant here? Let me uh, show you another project that's kind of like interesting. Uh, I've made that available, so we don't need to like spend too much time Googling things. Uh, Node has, uh, you know, it's a wonderful project, it's amazing people, uh, and has different like working groups. Uh, if you are interested in like, you know, being contributing to open source and, you know, working in, in the Node, uh, you know, foundation, uh, or like now the OpenJS Foundation, but like um, uh, there's like so many working groups, like the website working group, the Docker working group, the uh, uh, you know the security ecosystem working group, and all those things. Uh, and and Docker Node has uh, has this uh, uh, has a couple of images there, which uh, uh, it creates basically the Node user for you. So I don't have too much time to like dive in here, but um, if we do, let's see. It actually, um, where is this? I think somewhere there it has this uh, um, user, create user, there we go, user add, right? So it's creating a new user for you right at the top. That's why you basically have node in that node official image. Right. This is good, um, but we should be aware that, you know, we have copied the process as as a different user, as the root user, and only just before that we're dropping privileges. So what you actually want to do here is maybe uh, change your copy to something like uh, uh, you know just uh, ch on like the uh, like change ownership kind of like a, um, um, a command in Linux or something like that. So you do something mm -hmm. like this, and you know this is now uh, should be owned only by the node user. If that works. Cool. Looks like it's, uh, it's working. See that by this time, this time it's actually running as well. <laughs> uh, okay. We're good. I'll, I'll uh, save you. The whole. Okay, we're gonna fix this thing now that I have to like actually stop it like that. Does anyone know where those like names coming from? Let, let's. Uh, Let's engage the chat a bit. Brandy. Yeah, any, anybody out there in in the internet world's watching? Does anybody know where? If you don't uh, specifically name your container, do you know it'll give it a name? Do you know where those names come from? Anybody? Bueller, Bueller. Anyways, I'll give you a hint. It's it's definitely in the code. You can go read it in the code, and it's uh well th that's it. Uh, let's see if anybody answers. I don't. I start giving out hints already, <laughs> but um. All right. Um, I'll tell you, why, don't, why don't we do this? I've, I've been I've been wanting to do this for a while. If anybody, the first person in chat who tells, it can figure it out and tell me what those names come from. I'll send you a nice little uh, Docker swag package. Oh, I like that. Yeah, we'll definitely and, give uh, you a T-shirt. They're premium and maybe some stickers. So let's see. Let's see if anybody can get the answer first. Oh, there we go. Right. Nope. 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 No. 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 More. More. Uh, more Node questions. Who cares about Node? We're talking about. <laughs> Naming containers and T-shirts. Come on. <laughs> just, kidding, just kidding. All right. All right well, cool. uh, might have a good question here. So sometimes when you when you run npm install without sudo or root, you get permission denied for some packages. Okay. Please never, <laughs> never run npm install with sudo. Please do not do this. This is not a good practice because yeah. effectively. Okay, this is now taking us into a different route, and I like it. I like it. Great question, because this is effectively giving um, um, uh, here uh, the npm CLI access uh, to run anything as root. Now, why this is bad is because the way packages work and the npm CLI is that they have is that they have um, uh, uh, lifecycle hooks. So, like, if, if this was a library that someone would install, I could do things like you know pre install, and then know, RM minus RF, all of my like delete all of my directories, whatever. And that's it. And when someone installs it, including myself, 
that this will get executed. So I do not want that executed. Definitely not as, a, as like a root user. It's like really a bad practice. The reasons, I don't know like why you have it, but um, maybe you need that to like cross compile because of like uh, uh, GYP or whatever. I've, I've never uh, in like the recent years have used uh, sudo or have seen a need for it. So that's probably uh, either like an outdated module that needs that or I have no idea why uh, it needs it. But if, if you know why and you want to share, happy to like uh, uh, kind of like react to that uh, depending on what it what this is but yeah do not please do not do it yeah no i think i think that's a great great that's my that's my biggest fear right is what you just explained 100 yep. percent. yeah uh i don't want to scare anyone but uh <laughs> i'm gonna if you're looking at my terminal if you're doing something like this and they create node app you have essentially given a package out there with npx permission to download and execute those lifecycle uh, permissions for you so you do not want to turn that into this okay that's the reason of why not doing this thing so i don't want to scare you off npx but uh, uh these things have happened and generally speaking by the way like npm had some uh, uh you know the npm project is, is a great one but uh it had before some uh, kind of like bugs where when you'd install it it would like uh, uh like rip off like a slash lib directory or whatever like overwrite files that it shouldn't write and so so on so all the more reasons to never do this uh, uh, as root npm as a CLI yarn as well like never kind of those. And don't want to give uh, want to give people more power than they already have with uh, software software supply chain security issues. Yeah. Okay. Well, this works. Uh, so we're like close to time. So, but what we're gonna go there? We're gonna go there. So this works. You're fine. Um, you're fine. Yeah. Uh, so it works. I think we've seen it running, uh, but at this, at this point, really, um, we're going to move on from like the, the user permissions, which we have them right, and talk about this thing, which I told you like all of these are wrong, right? So let me know in the chat what kind of variations have you tried. Like, this is not a good way to like start your application. This is equally a bad way to start the app. Okay. This uh, let me let me continue. I don't know if you've seen this way of of like, uh, like a, a, a just basic basically telling the Docker engine how to like run the, the process. But this is another variation, which is also not a good way of doing it. Guess yeah. guess what's the next one? Sorry, let me. Uh, there you go. Not a good way either. Okay, all of these are not a good way of doing things. Well, you're while you're typing there, we we have a winner on the yeah. okay on the on the uh, name generation name generation. Ivan, okay. you're definitely correct. Yes, it generates names based on notable scientists and hackers, and it has a random random uh, left side of the name. Then you have an underscore, and then you have a scientist and hackers. I'm gonna drop right in the in the chat here. There is the um, and I'll put it on on the screen. So there's the code if you're interested. Uh, you can see all the names. You can see the the left hand side and the right hand side. And I think it actually has descriptions of why the scientists or hackers is uh, used in as a name. Anyways, awesome. Real quick, Ivan, reach out to me. Give me a uh, DM me on Twitter, and we could chat, and I'll get you some uh, Docker swag. Awesome. Nice. Okay. Okay, cool. 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 Um, let's continue with this one. Okay, so all of these are like really bad ways of doing things. Okay, this is uh, now why why is this a bad way? So, imagine basically you have uh, the container orchestration engine, right? Uh, Docker as Docker with the Docker daemon, Docker as Swarm, uh, Kubernetes, whatever you're using, and you have all of your containers deployed, and that engine or orchestration engine needs to tell those containers to like die or you know stop at, at one point right it needs to to, to scale uh, manage the scale elasticity and all of those things mm -hmm. so the way that it does it is it it sends a, a signal command right it does it ba does basically like this if you're on batch it does you know kill uh say kill or whatever and sends it to that process id right. essentially that is what is happening behind the scenes right docker tells that to that specific container now all of those things are different variations of what doesn't work all of this of what doesn't work well okay why why is that because let's, let's actually let me uh, keep that one just for reference so uh, 
and Stein is the uh, just a shortcut for it for the SQL. So what's actually happening here is npm is now wrapping the node process. So npm will actually start probably at like the the process ID one inside the container and, and may not forward request to the node app. So when you want to like interrupt it or terminate it, maybe it doesn't do it. Same issue with yarn, right? This is just to show you that it doesn't really matter if it's npm or yarn. Right now, yarn uh, like this uh, with like the, the bracket notation says something else. So this says uh, to Docker, please like wrap this up in in a shell in a shell wrapper. So it doesn't really make sense to do it like that. But if you have wanted to do something like this, it kind of makes sense, but not so much because the shell itself, like bash or whatever, is gonna like gonna go, going to get like uh, um, uh, executed in in the container itself. Is going to be running as process ID one, and then node is always going to like drop privilege or like drop process ID to like a lower one. That's why you've seen uh, when I was running it, it's like process ID twenty, right? Process ID eight, process ID something, and the shell, uh, you know, the shell is not forwarding any 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 relevant signals either. So all of those processes, even if you've done something yourself that is not handling processes, is basically leaving kind of like either not terminating in a correct way or kind of like kind of like think about it like uh, coming from the Linux world or the, the Unix world is like leaving zombie processes out early and not cleaned up with resources and things like that. So these are all basically, these are great if you're starting something, development, learning, whatever. These are not good practices for production. Right. So let's see. I mean, let's let's see what I actually mean here. Let's uh, let me leave those in comment and let's see what I actually mean by that. Um, so Docker, on. There we go. Okay, and now, uh, so I see that it's running it like that, and I'm connected. Docker, um, exec. Okay, so, I'm, so on the on the right side, I'm on my on, on inside the. Uh, what am I? Why am I doing Docker PS? On the right side, I'm actually in my um, inside the container itself. So maybe I do like this. You can see more of this better. So you can see node one is actually being bash, right? Uh, sorry, uh, being, being SH, right? And and npm and node are a different uh, process ID. So further out, let's let's say that I want to send a signal. Like let's say I want to send. You have Docker kill, which is a nice command. How does it works like this? I think signal equals um, say kill. And it needs the container name like this one. Let's try a different one, OK? Sig help. So if I'm sending all of those um, um, commands to the container itself, it's, it's not really doing anything. And if I send like uh, int for like interrupt, npm is just swallowing this up and does nothing with it. Interrupt should be the con uh, control C, which is what I'm doing here, but it doesn't really work, OK? Only reason that it works with kill is that basically that shell is getting is getting killed, and that's why everything else gets killed as well. That's the only reason this works. Right. So what we should actually do for it, uh, and this is where I actually want to like move to like a, maybe a different image as uh, as we're going to talk about like also images is basically use uh, dump in it. That's the, the name of um, of the tool. Let me go back into here. Uh, kind of like dump in it. Uh, uh, I'll show you how to install it, but I just want to do it in like a different uh, image. And this is where I actually want to fix it. Okay, but let, let's stay here for like a little bit longer and, and talk about. We'll, we'll get back into like this situation uh, uh, in a bit. Like what's the, what should be the proper uh, conversion here for like what is the best practice? Let's talk about Node 14, right? Node 14 as an image itself is also like a very big image, and it can have some issues with it. So uh, what do I mean by that? So if you go and use this um, go back here, Docker scan. I'll go ahead and scan Docker uh, node. And I'll see what exactly is inside it. There you go, like this. And the idea here is that basically I'm trying to say, well, what what kind of libraries exist on it? What is the node version runtime that exists on it that may have vulnerabilities inside it? Because this is basically shipping, first of all, a really big application, and secondly, uh, uh, you know, potentially vulnerable one, which is also something we want to kind of like you know take uh, uh, take take slightly down. So to do that, um, I'm scanning it with Docker Scan, 
and it will give me some results to it. And I can show you the other way while it's doing this, and that is the other way of for you to basically scan that. So if you went into, for example, uh, uh, the sneak UI and you added a new project, whether from like a GitHub or maybe a, a you know a different uh, a SEM, or maybe added through Docker Hub, it would go ahead and and you know figure out what are the manifest file that uh, Sneak supports. And uh, this is a different application that I have uh, the rental goof, and it will go ahead and uh, and pick it up for you. And when I when I click it to go inside, I can see what it what it actually detected. So this is uh, the base image is node six stretch. Now, before I show you all of this here, I want to show you what is going on with the CLI there. Um, give it a few seconds until it finishes, because one of those dilemmas that you have, you're going to have with your, your node images is the fact that they have a ton of vulnerabilities. So node by itself as, an, as a base image comes with hundreds of vulnerabilities. This is like 600, 700, 800, and I mean, no one wants to kind of like you know close the door once they leave home and leave the door like a little bit open, leave the window a little bit. It's like just low severity window open, right? It's not it's not a high one. It's not the whole door. It's not, it's locked, but hey, like the, it's medium vulnerability somewhere. You don't want to do that, uh, and that's why basically you also like want to have a, kind of like a good baseline going into production. I'm not gonna say you have zero vulnerabilities, but do your best to basically start from like a really good point rather than starting with the default and kind of like taking that um, uh, into production with you. So the reason you want to do that is both um, uh, the vulnerabilities exist on the image itself, but here I'm kind of like preaching to the choir because I know like a lot of people are already like aware of this. But what I find that thing a bit uh, relates like that from node that we started with is the fact that, hey, the node runtime itself could also have vulnerabilities. And this relates like my, my from node, right? Like we start with, from node in the Docker file, and do you know even which version of node are you running in production? So yes, let's say now you've moved into this, um, you know, from node 14, 10, 1, and like this is kind of like you know very like pinned version. But now do you know what happens if tomorrow there's a new CVE going out for node 14, you know, 10, 1 that's applicable for it? So it's it's the container itself is not just the libraries in it; it's actually the runtime itself. And node, you know. I think this week or last week it had like a security release, right? It's, it's happening every few months, so you should definitely be like on top of those things. So as an example, right? This is uh, uh, this is kind of like finished scanning, and you can see I've like used the uh, uh, the Docker uh, like native command that CLI has scanned uh, in like later versions. So if you update, you're gonna get it, and it it, it finds a lot of uh, issues, right? In in a, in a ton of libraries that I have inside, it tells you where it's coming from. And all of those things, like if it's in the base image or you're adding it from like run up to get something, but it's also telling you, uh, you know, maybe you're getting it from uh, uh, like where you, you're vulnerable from like the node runtime itself. You see, a lot of vulnerabilities in node itself, all of the more reasons to actually um, update to a new version. But which version will you go to? Like there's like 624 issues and you're using 1410. Should you move to like 14? Uh, 14, 12, 14, 15, I don't know, 14, 15. What, what should you actually move to? Should you go back to 12, like the, the, the previous audience? Who knows? I don't know. I have no idea. And I'm not going to scan them by, by myself. So the whole point is I could I could give this, I think this uh, this works with like a Docker file where you give it this extra um, uh, argument. And it might take a bit of time, so I'll run it. But uh, if it doesn't complete the problem, stop it in the middle. Because it has like a better UI uh, here, which I, I like. Uh, better and so and so that's what I want to show you now. So like this is the current image, right? But it tells you, hey, I can move to like a major upgrade from like node six to node ten. You're gonna you know remediate some hundred of vulnerabilities here. But actually, better yet, you could actually move to like alternative upgrades. You could move to like node fourteen and and uh, uh, and dash slim, like a lower, uh, smaller image size as well as smaller uh, vulnerability footprint. So I I want to move to that kind of image rather than be maybe on, on the default and like go out with uh, 800 of vulnerabilities. So yeah, I mean, this is going to take time. I'm going to just stop it here. But uh, uh, hopefully, this, uh, this is uh, kind of clear. So I'll, I'll go with a different kind of like image, uh, the Alpine images, which are they have a different way in the way that they manage like their security vulnerabilities and uh, and um, and all of those like updates. So I'm, I'm not going to go into that. But uh, let's see if this works just like uh, we are using. Um... 
smaller version as well as lower vulnerability footprint probably. Okay. Let's try that while we're uh, talking about something else. Right on. Yep. So Chris is mentioning the the um, the dominant the Docker the teeny the Docker is uh, built in. That's but that's correct. You need to use the dash dash and in, init, um, Chris. Yeah. Oh, there's there's a different way to do it. So I'm gonna do it now. Awesome. Uh, but you know, while this works, and before we do it, uh, just to show you to to see what's working out, let's let's update our application here. So I've put a process handler. So all I'll do is I'll do a new function, call it uh, handler. Makes sense. Good naming conventions is why we're here, and say uh, received event. Um, see no. And I'll say process. Process on. Hopefully, this remembers what this is. Uh, sig int, um, sig int, sig HP maybe. Let's see if that works. We want to see that we're just getting and handling this uh, this signal. What I mean by that is okay. So first of all. The other one, right? We did uh, the the sneak scan, uh, the Docker scan, sorry, with uh, the sneak behind the scenes, uh, and and you see that this is already like a better uh, starting point to go with, and it's a smaller image as well, so that's great. Uh, and now we can go ahead and do uh, Docker build and just build this one again, uh, but we've changed an image, and I changed the source code, so we could actually print to the console when we're getting those signal handlers. Hopefully, I have no. Uh, no issues there. Docker on. Running, running. OK, I think it's running. So now let's do this. So Docker, um, Docker kill minus minus signal is, what did we send? Did we listen on? Yeah, CHUP, OK. CHUP, and then I'll send that over to Wait, this is the new one. Is it not? It is. So let's see if this is a bug somewhere else. Process on CHUP handler. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, let's try this one again. Oh, okay. Let's try to build this one. Build. I don't want to use caching here, so. Um, cache. Well, that's building. I got a, a question from chat. So while running Docker scan, does it refer only to the sneak database or multiple vulnerability databases? I'll I'll give that one to you, Liram. Oh, sorry, I was like, uh, oh, you were, but, uh, <laughs> you were looking at the, okay, yeah. So running Docker scan, does it refer to only the single? Okay, got it, got it. So, um, sneak behind the scene uses um, uh, uses uh, like multiple sources of databases. So there's the sneak vulnerable database that this is the one that we that we use. Uh, but we so this is it right this is the, the the sneak in there's a whole security research team and what it does is basically uh, curate you know across different languages and ecosystems all of those uh, vulnerabilities go out but it's it's not just that it's actually uh, beyond this right we are um, if you go to like security intelligence you'll find more so we work with like academia people um, you know like uh, uh, researchers and they find a lot of issues and they report to us we also act as like a, as a, as like a um, an NVD, like authorized uh, um, a numbering authority. So what that actually means is that we get reports and we can actually assign CVEs for them. So there's a whole security research that we do as well. Uh, and like all of that, along with basically going into and tapping into things like NVD and like the Ubuntu's and the Red Hat's like uh, vulnerability database as well, as well as like also 
listening to what is happening on open source, right? Like if someone opens a GitHub issue and says XSS in you know Fastify or whatever, we'll probably find that really, really fast, like faster than other people are finding those things, detecting it faster and uh, and and issuing it as like a vulnerability for you before it actually you know gets a CVE, which in open source is like it, it, it is really hard or has been until you know recent days uh, to basically turn something a report into a cv because it just kind of like dies off in the open like the github kind of like issue queue and things like that so yeah uh, hopefully that answers it yeah and chris and chris is right too there in the chat the the docker scan command is integrated with sneak okay idea what's going on here but let me try another one I don't think Snake is here. I know I catch in the past. I've catched Sig Int and Sig uh, Term. Yeah, this should work as well. Maybe my command is is rough. Let's see. Oh, not exact. Um, okay, so again. Uh, this one. All right. So, feature. I have no idea what is going on at the moment. Oh, that's. A, I see what you're doing. You're sending in the the sig up, actual signal. Yeah. 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 Gotcha. Gotcha. In that then and thank you. I think that should work. I'm wondering if I've, I've done this uh, differently before, but uh, oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, it, it's sorry about that. It's my mind is is on the dumb in it, but. <laughs> The reason this doesn't work, like it shouldn't work. <laughs> Sorry about that. It doesn't work is because uh, this is what we're doing. So NPM is actually swallowing the event. I'm like, ah, yeah. I'm <laughs> racing off like the dumb in in my head. Yeah. But uh, this is why it doesn't work. So let me show you why it do when, when it does work. And that is, uh, so now we're, this is what basically what we're going to do is basically add uh, dumb in it into it. Awesome. But how do we do it? So um, what I'm going to do is run um, APK add uh, dumb in it. And that's basically going to use APK is my uh, uh, package manager on Alpine. It's just going to install dumb in it on it. Uh, so I'm going to put it here a bit earlier as well. So it can uh, use the cache uh, better, um, uh, like the, the Docker layer thing cache. And uh, I need to change this one. And yeah, for, for the sake of time, I could have shown you like all the permutations. But you see that now why? Node is actually not getting the events. Like this is what we want. We want we want to want to capture these events. And even though I've put like sorry about that, even though I've put like this event handler here, I'm getting nothing because npm is swallowing those events and not moving them forward. Right. So now I'm gonna just change this. I'm gonna use this notation, which is the better one, uh, as it's um, a better one anyway. And I need like once I have them in it here, that's. Uh, and I mean, I don't want to start NPM. I'm just going to do no directive because I don't, I don't want to wrap it as well. Like, what, if, what happens if tomorrow there's like a regression in NPM? Even if they like fix everything and all the events are like signals moving to you, and there's a regression. You do not want to be basically uh, um, like typed into that one. So let, let's try that one and see what happens now. Yeah, and it just it adds a layer of complexity, right? That's just not needed, right? Just use node. Yep. And for those of you that joined late, uh, Liram was talking about earlier. It's totally fine if you're running local. You're running in a dev environment. You got a local dev server that's, um, you know, updating constantly, watching files, those type of things. Totally fine in dev, right? You can you can use npm start, npm yarn start, all those things. Specifically talking about production, it's a really bad idea for production. Yep. Okay, so first of all, let's see what's happening inside. Okay, so as we're inside, we can see that. Um, Oh, yeah, so you can see that uh, Dumbinate is running as one, but then uh, Node uh, is still getting dropped as like a different process. But this is okay because 
dump in it and add no acts as like you know acts as like a proper uh init you know process id one and, and, and in its system so it knows to like drop uh not drop like forward all of those uh, signals to the other processes and in our case this is node and that's exactly what we need so it's just making sure that we have here what we've expected to build and i think like if i try now to send that docker kill command is when it should work it wasn't a kill right it was like a see how yep yeah, let's see. And our container name this time is Crazy Capita. <laughs> okay, so see, wonderful. There we go. There we go. This is what we intended to do. Now the node app is receiving SIGHUB, which is what I sent it, or what you know your orchestration engine tomorrow morning in production will send it. And I don't know, depending on what you wanted it to do, it will do it. So for our sake, I just did a you know console log, but you want to do other things, right? You want to do basically, you want to have things like uh, term and kill and, oh, there we go, I have it. I didn't, sorry, you cannot actually do that one, but um, you can attach to C hop and C term. And that is where you want to do things like maybe fastify close because you wanted to like close all the connections and, you know, await close and await database close, whatever, I don't know, do whatever, like, Clean up resources that you need, right? And then close. Like this is important not because of like cleaning up memory and things like that. Like if we did not have all of those, and uh, uh, if we did not like even put a handler here, what would happen is it would get abruptly um, uh, killed. And that means that if there were like a, a think of like an actual like production item, and there could be like uh, connections going in. So you are actually like dropping a container and dropping the the connections contain like going into it. So what you actually want to do is that that wait fastify close here. It's actually super important because it means it allows those connections to finish, and 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 it at that point when you do it, um, uh, fastify will not receive new requests either. So no new requests, current requests going down, 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 finishing, working, and then this container can go you know die off uh, just fine, right? No issues there. No one gets you know uh, abruptly disconnected from whatever they were doing with this app. Right. So uh, this is uh, why we need to do it. Well, um, I don't know. I think we've gone through quite a bit. Is there any questions so far? Let's see. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see here. They're just looking at chat. Yeah. Is there a uh, with that? Anything there or? Uh... No, I think we're. I think we're good. I, some things about it. Uh, Chris is talking a little bit about an entry points and stuff. I don't want to dive too deep into that. Um, yeah, th there's some other general best practices, right, that you can think about. Yeah, I mean, I think that the thing to think about is what we went over today is is really a good foundation, right? And then using entry points and commands and different ways you want to start processes and control processes, right, with inside your container. You can get a little bit more advanced. But these these are the not. I hesitate to say basics right but it's the foundation right lay lay the foundation correctly right make sure you're pinning um your images and and walking down through your best practices uh this has been fantastic we're having you back of course you're coming back <laughs> soon right i am i'm coming i'm counting on it yes absolutely absolutely well awesome awesome thank you so much for running us through all this great great best practices if you're a node uh engineer and using containers which you should be if you're not shame on you Totally kidding. Um, you know, <laughs> but you know, the, all these best practices. Reach out to both of us. So, Liam, where where can folks find you on the on the interwebs if they want to uh, chat and connect with you? Sure. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm I'm on Twitter just like everyone else. Go there to complain and uh, and uh, and shout. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I'm there. Reach out. I've got this. Uh, uh, all that we went through is basically we opened that one as well. Uh, on this blog, a uh, very one, very kind of like step by step that I was uh, uh, trying to like walk through uh, with you on this. It's like a cheat sheet if you wanted to download it. Uh, so you can follow all the blogs I'm writing on the Sneak blog or tweet me on Twitter, and uh, you know, happy to chat with you and uh, continue this conversation offline as well. Awesome, and I'll put that I put the blog link in the in the chat, but I'll also put it in the show notes in in uh, YouTube, so you can see that link there. Again. Thank you. So let me uh, let me let me tell everybody about wonderful um, DockerCon is coming up. Um, 
where is my link? There it is. So go pre-register. Uh, we'll be opening up registrations pretty soon. Our CFP is open. If you want to give a talk uh, at DockerCon, please submit a CFP. We're starting the re review process now. Um, if you've never given a talk at a conference, don't let that don't de let that deter you from submitting a CFP. Right? We're we're always looking for not just the usual suspects, and we do because they give great talks and have great information. But we're also looking for uh, newbies, first time speakers those type of things. And we'll help you uh, craft your your talk. We give a lot of help for give pre uh, when you do give your presentation. So please submit uh, CFPs. Also head over to uh, the community, join our Docker community. We have a, um, a community Slack. A lot of our engineers are in there. Our Docker captains are in there. Uh, our product managers are in there. A lot of folks from uh, Docker are in there. And the community, I mean, the, the Docker community is phenomenal. Um, super helpful. If you have any questions, uh, the community is a great place to continue the conversations. I'm in there. Um, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. Of course, I'm on Twitter too. Um, reach out to me. Uh, please don't yell at me on Twitter. It hurts my feelings. Um, but no, just, just kidding. But uh, love to have a conversation on Twitter. And then I'm also in the community Slack. So feel free to, uh, what do they call it? A private message, DM, direct message, whatever they call it, whatever the kids call it these days. Please send me a message, even if it's just say hello. Love to hear from everybody. I do have one caveat for reaching out um, on email, Slack, Twitter, or anything like that. Uh, very, very hard for me to help you troubleshoot your specific environment and the issues you're having. Um, you know, they just get really into the into the lower level technical details. Um, but if you have general questions or even more advanced questions, please reach out. If it's too much, you know, I'll, I'll get you pointed in the right direction. But awesome, there. Thank you again. Really, really appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to, to when we can get together. I can buy you a drink because I'm dying to hear. I, I got to get the Yoda story. But uh, <laughs> you oh got God. a bar behind you. So maybe I'll, maybe I'll give you, feed you a couple drinks and you'll play a song. <laughs> <laughs> well, awesome, my friend. Thanks so much for coming on. I really, really appreciate it. We're going to have you back on in a couple more weeks. So everybody stay tuned for that. But thanks again. Everybody have a wonderful weekend and I'm really happy you showed up. Ciao. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.